Good morning and welcome to Awaken Life Church Online. As we start the service today, we would like to say thank you to everyone that has been giving faithfully into our ministry. Your faithful giving has enabled us to carry on doing what we do and to expand the kingdom of God. Whether it's a tithe or an offering or a contribution towards our food parcel and whether it's EFT or in cash, we are really very grateful. And we pray that the Lord will continue enabling you to do it in Jesus' name. And today I would like to read the priestly blessing over your life. And it's found in Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 to 26. And it reads the following. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you and we thank you for your goodness, for your blessings that you have demonstrated upon each one of our lives. We come with gratitude because you have supplied our needs. And today I want to bring every single person and pray a blessing over every individual, every family, and every household. May your provision remain with each one and we give you honor and glory for your continuous blessings in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Enjoy the service and be blessed.
Father, I pray that that is our heart's cry this morning, that we are singing Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Father, I pray that our worship will not end when the singing part of a service is over. But I pray, Lord, that we are continuously singing your praises and worshiping you every day of the week, every minute of our lives, Lord. I pray that we'll understand that worshiping you is a lifestyle. It comes from the heart. And so, Father, I pray that we will worship you in spirit and in truth and that those words will ring true to each and every one of us that we will never stop singing. The music may stop, but our hearts will never stop singing. Father, I pray that we'll continue to see your goodness in our lives. I pray that we'll continue to see the big and the small ways that you are moving in our lives, the ways that you are working for us. Father, I pray that we'll continue to come before you with our requests, that we'll come before you with our thanksgiving. I pray that we won't only come to you when we need something, but that we are going to come to you every day, thanking you for your work in our lives, for your love. So Lord, as we sing to you, as we honour you, I pray, I pray that our hearts will just be seeking more of you, a closer relationship with you, a closer encounter with you. And I pray that we'll never get tired of walking with you, of seeking more of you and spending time in your presence. So may we just enjoy this time soaking in your presence and feeling your love surround us. That we can feel worthy and special because you love us. You created us with a greater purpose. So may we live our lives with that knowledge with that confidence. Father, I pray that our hearts will receive your word this morning, that your word will fall on good soil, that we will accept what you have to say to us this morning and that we will act upon it, that we will apply it to our lives. Let me just give you all honour and praise, Lord. Amen. Amen. Good day, church. Good to be together with you online again. But hey, from the first Sunday of March, the 7th of March, we will start gathering in person again. Yay! So, hope to see you there. Come and join us for in-person services. I'm looking forward to seeing you there. We are limited to 50 people, so we need to register to attend. It's a safe environment. The service is shorter. We keep social distancing and all other protocols. Don't forget to bring your mask. For now, we are not opening kids' church, but your children can sit together with you, so bring them along, okay? So as that day approaches, go to our website and book your seat. I'm looking forward to seeing you back with us again. Amen. Well, today I want to speak to you about the blessed hope. What comes to your mind when I say this phrase, the blessed hope? What does it mean to you? To many of you, to many believers, the blessed hope means the return of Jesus. For 2,000 years, the blessed hope has been a source of motivation, of encouragement, and of hope for the Christian church. Right now, in this global pandemic, Many are asking if this is a time for the return of Jesus. Since this pandemic started, I have made many references in my messages to the return of Christ and to biblical prophecies concerning His return. But I have not dedicated an entire message or series just to this topic. And so uh, today I want to spend some time talking about it. I want to dedicate some time to talking about this topic. I have received a few questions from some of you with regards to the uh, return of Jesus and how it relates to the events taking place now on social media. There are many messages, videos and audios doing the rounds, bringing a lot of confusion and fear 
concerning the matter of the pandemic, vaccines, the mark of the beast, 5G, the return of Jesus. And those producing these messages include some believers and church leaders speaking very convincingly and passionately about these matters. Unfortunately, some of these messages are not theologically nor scientifically sound. But due to a convincing presentation, many people accept them as truth. In times like these, your best and only safeguard is the Word of God. You need to have convictions concerning what you believe about the end time. You need to be confident of your interpretation of end time events as described in scripture. You need to know that the word of God is true and will come to pass. There can be no room for doubt in your mind, otherwise you will be open to deception. One of the claims the Bible makes is that in the last days, false prophets will deceive many. If we don't take time to become personally familiar with end time scriptures and events, then we are open targets for false teachers and charlatans or even to well-intended persons who are just totally misinformed. So, I'm going to share with you, in broad strokes, some forthcoming end-time events. There isn't a complete consensus among believers about the timing of some end-time events and how they will occur. I will share with you some of these conflicting views and then share what I believe and why I believe it. But you must know this. No matter what your interpretation of end time events are, no matter which camp you prefer, the way to be prepared for the end time is the same for all. You have to be saved. You have to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ and believe in Him as your personal Savior. You have to have that relationship with Him, then no matter your interpretation of end time events, you are ready for His coming and you can look forward to His return. You can be confident that He will be with you and help you to get through the end time events which are about to come upon the earth. Today I will speak to you about the blessed hope. I will try to be as clear as possible and hopefully you will have a clearer biblical understanding of end time events so you won't be intimidated or misguided by all the noise going on around us. A lot can be said about this matter, but I will just cover some key points. Let me start by reading my text for today, which comes from Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that Deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and Purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. <laughs> Amen. Notice a few points about this passage. The grace of God in the person of Jesus Christ appeared to all men, has been presented to all men. His call is for us to deny and reject, to turn our back on ungodliness and worldly lusts, which surround our lives every day in so many ways. And instead of looking for fulfillment in the things of this world, we are to look forward to the return of Christ, which is our blessed hope, our motivation, what we live for. It is Jesus who gave himself to pay the price for our sins so that we should not be condemned together with this lawless generation, but be separate. The Bible says he is special people desiring to do whatever pleases God. And we are to live in the expectation that Jesus could return at any moment. And this is the blessed hope. Did you know that from the day of Pentecost, there have always been believers that have lived with this expectation? It is this blessed hope that gave the church courage 
to face endless waves of persecution and resistance over the past 2,000 years. It is the hope and desire to see Jesus returning that has kept the church focused on its mission from Pentecost until today. And it is this blessed hope that will keep the church going until the day of Christ's return. But when will he return? Should he not have returned already? Many Christians still ask this question today. They are in good company because already in the first century, there were believers asking it sincerely and unbelievers asking it in a mocking way. Listen to Peter's response in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So you see, although some think the Lord is being slack, he's taking too long. He is actually being very patient with humanity, not willing that any should perish and be separated from him. So he's giving humanity time to repent. Unfortunately, there are still many who refuse to accept God's gift of salvation and insist on living their own way, guided by their lusts and desires. But the day will come, however, when time will be up and the Lord will return and all who rejected him will have to face the Lord's wrath. The fact is that we do not know when he will return. During his ministry, the disciples of Jesus asked this. They asked Jesus, when would he return? As he was teaching about end times. And his reply was the following, Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. What was his answer to his disciples? Hey, no one knows the day. Matthew 25, 13. Jesus says, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So just just stay ready, okay? Just just stay ready, watch out, be ready for His coming because you don't know the day nor the hour. (laughs) You see, the instruction is for us to be alert, anticipating His return, for no one knows when He will return. In one of His parables, Jesus concluded with this, Luke 12, 39 to 40. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. In other words, the Son of Man, Jesus, is coming like a thief in the night when no one expects. And so we must be alert, not lulled into sleep by the matters, ways, stories, and lusts of this life and of this world. Luke 21, 34, Jesus said, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing drunkenness and the cares of this life. And that day, come on you, unexpectedly. So Jesus made it clear during his ministry, that he would return one day suddenly and that the believers must be ready for his return. After his resurrection, as he was giving some final instructions about the kingdom, the disciples asked him again when he would return to restore Israel. And this was his reply. It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. He cut them right there. I'm not going to tell you when, just be ready. The Apostle Paul repeated the teaching of Jesus when the believers of Thessalonica inquired about the return of Christ. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 2, Paul says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly (laughs) that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Listen, Paul had taught this to them already, and yet they are coming again, but, 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 but. And so he tells them, listen, you, you, you know perfectly well that the day of the Lord 
is coming as a thief in the night. All right? Nobody knows when he's going to come. Peter made the same declaration. Both Paul and Peter make it clear in their writings that Jesus will come suddenly, like a thief in the night, and no one is able to put a date to it. Now listen carefully. When you hear people, these people, and there are many, many around have been in the saw today, when you hear these people putting dates, declaring that Jesus will return by a certain year or a certain month or even an exact date as some have done in the past, do not believe them, okay? No matter how logic or detailed their theories are, no matter how many Bible verses they quote to support their dates, no matter how many world events they point to, do not believe them. No matter if they say that the Lord spoke to them in a dream or that they were taken to heaven and the Lord gave them a revelation, do not believe them. All right? Why? Because Jesus said, no one knows. Scripture says, no one knows. And we follow Scripture first. Anything that happens outside must support Scripture. If you have to, to, to choose between Scripture and outside events, man, I'm going to choose Scripture. Amen? Jesus said, you will come like a thief in the night. What are we to do? We are to watch. So, the minute someone starts putting dates forward, you drop that thing immediately. It is false. Unfortunately, we've had even sincere men of God in the past decades putting forward dates. And they were so convincing that they're preaching and, 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 and promoted that idea. People believe them. And of course, many got disappointed. Many even left the faith. Then there are a number of false teachers and cults that also put forth dates. And many people fell for it and are still falling for it today. So, no dates. Amen? No dates. We do not know. But now you may ask, Pastor, if you say no one knows the date, the day, or the hour, then how come you've said many times that Jesus is coming back soon? <laughs> how do you know it is soon? Hey, that's a good question. And I'm going to tell you why and how I know that he is coming back soon. I have quoted to you something that Paul said, where he said, For yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. So you know he'll come unexpectedly. But listen to what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4. But you, brethren, you are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. That is, they should surprise you as a thief. You see, those who are sleeping are in darkness. They are oblivious to what is happening around them. But we are children of the light. And even in the darkness of this world, if we are alert and watching, we will not be surprised by the thief because we are in the light. As soon as the thief approaches, we see him coming and we are not caught off guard, right? So here is something else that Jesus said in Matthew 24 when he was teaching about the signs of the end times. He said the following, Matthew 24, verses 32 and 33. Now, learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things, know that it is near at the doors. Now, this word is for the church, for those who are alert and watching, for those who have the blessed hope of the return of Christ. No one can figure out the date exactly when he will return. But Jesus said that if you see certain things happening, then you must know that the day is approaching. It's one thing to say that the return of Jesus will happen in a certain year or date. It is another to say that the return of Jesus is approaching. I cannot tell you when he will return, but I can tell you that the day of his return is approaching. Amen? And why do I say it is approaching? Let me share some things with you. Listen to what Peter wrote. 1 Peter 4, 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. He's saying here that 
We're in the last days. The end is near. Peter, the apostles and in the first century church believed that they were in the last days and that Jesus could return at any moment. And so Peter instructs the believers to be alert, to watch, to pray. That they believe that they were in the last days is confirmed by what John wrote. 1 John 2, 18, he says, little children, it is the last hour, <laughs> never mind the last days. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Wow, for John, it was the last hour. <laughs> never mind the last day. So it is my question. If in the first century, the church was in the last days or last hour, where do you think we are today? 2,000 years later in relation to the return of Christ? <laughs> if they were in the last hour, man, we must be in the last minutes or seconds then, right? And so I believe that the return of Jesus is approaching. Another reason I know that the return of Christ is approaching is by having an overview of the biblical timeline. Now listen, remember, the Bible is God's revelation to mankind. The Bible is a book about God's dealings with men. It is not a history book, but it is historically correct. It's not a geography book, but it has been used to accurately find ancient places. It is not a science book, yet it is scientifically correct. And one could discuss each of these aspects at length, but what I want to emphasize is this, that the Bible is not an ordinary book. It is difficult for the natural mind to grasp some of the spiritual principles revealed in the Bible. This book has been loved and hated. It has been published and destroyed, and yet it remains. It has withstood the test of time, and it is as relevant today as it has been in the past. Unbelievers and the world's system reject the notion of the Bible being inspired by God. They want to bring it down to the level of any other religious book written by men. And yet, although it was men who wrote the Bible, it was inspired by God. God opened his mouth, he spoke, and he created the universe. And then he opened his mouth and spoke to men who put his words on paper. Amen. And now we have the word of God. They wrote, they put down certain facts, prophecies as the Lord inspired them. They wrote certain accounts that would in time form a unified story. Many books coming together in one book. The Bible contains prophecy. The Bible reveals the destiny and the history of mankind. And it unfolds the plan of God for eternity. So now I'm going to summarize the Bible for you in six chapters. There are many different and useful ways of summarizing the Bible to have an idea of its contents. But this particular version allows me to have a quick and simple picture of the biblical timeline. And therefore, it allows me to have a clear idea of where I am in history. So grab a pen and paper and take notes. I'm going to summarize the Bible in six chapters. I'm going to give you six words, all beginning with the letter C. Number one, first chapter, creation. God spoke the universe into existence. Then he made man according to his image and likeness and put them in a garden and it was very good. Chapter number two, crisis, sin entered the world. God gave them one command. And they broke it. Instead of learning from God, they wanted to learn independently from God. And sin began to have its consequence upon the earth and spoil all that had been created. God said to Adam, the day you eat this fruit, you will die. And he did. The Bible teaches that for God, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. That's in 2 Peter 3, 8. And Adam did not live beyond a thousand years. At 930 years, Adam died. Third chapter, covenant. As people became corrupt, God brought judgment upon the world. The flood came and there was a restart. But because man was still separated from God, their evil heart soon caused sin to spread again. And so God looked for a man that would trust him and obey him. And he found Abraham. And so he cut a covenant with Abraham. And from Abraham, God raised up the nation of Israel through whom? He showed many signs and wonders. He showed his power to the world. From the nation of Israel, when the time was right, Jesus was born. And this brings us to the fourth chapter of this timeline, Christ. 
Over 200 Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled at the birth of Christ, His life, His death and resurrection. Jesus came for His people, the Jews, but they rejected Him. After His resurrection, Jesus instructed His disciples to take the gospel to the whole world, Jews and Gentiles. And that takes us to the fifth chapter of the Bible story narrative, which is the church. On the day of Pentecost, the church was activated and launched in the power of the Holy Spirit, and it is still active today and will remain active until the return of Christ. From creation to Christ, it covered about 4,000 years, and the church has been active for 2,000 years. And this right now is where we are on the biblical timeline near the final chapter of the Bible. Number six, C for consummation. That means the end, the wrapping up of everything. And this final chapter in the Bible will last about a thousand years. It will involve the following events, the return of Jesus in the clouds to fetch his church. It will involve a time of tribulation where God deals with Israel. It will involve a time of great tribulation where the wrath of God is poured upon the earth, upon the ungodly. It will involve the return of Jesus to earth to rule and reign the earth from Jerusalem for a thousand years. The church will rule and reign with him during this time. And after a thousand year reign, there will be the final judgment. Satan, his demons and his followers will be cast in the lake of fire forever. The heavens and the earth will be renewed and we will enter the age or ages to come where there will be no more death, no more sin and we live with him forevermore. I just gave you a quick overview of this last uh, chapter. We will study some of these things in other messages. My intention here was to give an overview of where the Bible says we are and where we are going. Six chapters. And where are we? Chapter number five. <laughs> At the end of chapter number five, if I may say so. So I hope this outline of the Bible has helped you to see where we are in God's clock. You see, although no one knows the day or the hour, by understanding the times we're living, by watching and being vigilant, we can tell that we are close to the end. The church chapter or church era or time of grace, that whole period, that this last 2,000 years is categorized as the last days. The moment the church was launched in Pentecost day, the last days began. And that is why the first century believers were ready for the return of Christ. Today we have the benefit of history and many world events to help us to even better understand and define where we are. Another reason I know the return of Jesus is near is the manifestation of the signs that Jesus mentions. The signs that Jesus mentions in Matthew 24 verses 6 to 7 are becoming more and more visible. Wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Here, nation means ethnic groups. It's ethnic groups against ethnic groups or tribes against tribes. Uh, kingdoms are governments or rulers. And so rulers against rulers or governments against governments. It could be rulers in the same country or rulers from different countries. Are we seeing these things happening today? Of course we are. And it is growing more and more. Look around you, follow the news. It says there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. We are seeing a great escalation of these things over the past few decades. Look at what the world is going through right now. And so although there have always been wars and natural disasters, we have seen an unprecedented escalation of these over the last few decades, the last 50 years. And to me, that is clearly a sign that the return of Jesus is near. One more indication of the return of Jesus is the behavior patterns we see today. Listen to this passage from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. But know this, he says, know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, 
but denying its power and from such people, turn away. Again, there have always been such people to some degree over the last 2,000 years. But what is happening today? There was a time where in society, many of these behaviors, these characteristics were frowned upon. Today, it is becoming normal, even encouraged. The Bible says that God will bring judgment to those who call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness. That's in Isaiah 5.20. We see an abundance of this today. Things that were wrong 30 years ago are right today and vice versa. Slowly but surely, the Western world, which prospered largely due to living and abiding by the Judeo-Biblical worldview, is turning its back on the Bible and its principles in the name of human rights and of tolerance and are breaking the laws of God and going against those who would live by the laws of God as revealed in the Bible. Mm. And so, if you live in the light, if you are, are alert, if you are watching, you are aware of these end time scriptures and end time warnings, then you know the return of Jesus is near. What must you do? And obviously there are other signs. I'm not going to go into all of them today. What must you do? Let's go back to our text for today, Titus 2, 11, 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, in this crazy world that you are right now. There it is. Deny. Turn your back on ungodliness, on the lusts, the temptations, the flesh-pleasing and flesh-exalting ways of the world. Instead of living to please ourselves, let us be sober, self-controlled, and live to please God in this present age. Verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So we are to live looking forward to the return of Christ, not fearing it because we know it will be glorious. Let us allow the word and the spirit of God to fill our lives and to purify us. Let us be willing to do the good works that the Lord has set before us, telling others about the gospel and helping others find salvation and peace through a living relationship with Jesus. Amen. We will continue talking about the return of Jesus next week. In the meantime, remain faithful, pray, read the word, enjoy the love of God, which is perfect and in which is no fear and share the love of God with others. Amen. Let us close in prayer. Lord, thank you that you give us the light of the word of God, the light of scripture. And you enable us to understand the times and seasons that we are in. Yes, Lord, we do not know when you are coming, at what hour, but we do realize that your coming is near. And all we pray, Lord, is give us the strength to remain faithful, to remain close to you, to remain faithful to you, Lord God, serving you until the day you return. Bless your people, Father God. Help those that are struggling with fears in this crazy time to realize that everything is all right. Everything is following the order it should until the day that you return. Thank you for blessing everyone, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, stay in peace. Have a blessed week. See you next Sunday as we continue talking about end time matters. God bless you.